If you're ever in the middle of making what will eventually become the most important space opera ever put on the small screen, stop and ask yourself one very important question. Did we remember to cater to the British Invasion crowd? Welcome to Trek Record. I'm your host, Rebecca, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite Star Trek candidates, the casting and the styling of Pavel Chekhov. So it's 1967, and Star Trek is hovering at moderate success with fairly inconsistent ratings. This is part for the course as far as Trek is concerned, as big of a cultural juggernaut as it would eventually grow to become. Contemporarily, Star Trek floundered in the eyes of studios and struggled to retain viewership. Worried about the low pool with younger generations, the network urged showrunner Gene Roddenberry to add another recurring cast member to the bridge crew. A young man designed to appeal to the young girls, famously an undertapped market by Trek. Roddenberry agreed and drafted up the character of Ensign Jones and began a hilariously short casting process. You see, there were actually only two people who auditioned for the role, and the second guy was the guy who got the job. Semi green actor Walter Koenig was hired basically on the spot. Was it perhaps because of his charm or comedic timing, you may ask? No. Um, not exactly. It was more because he was basically identical to Davy Jones of the Monkees. Here we come, walk down the street. We get funniest looks from everyone we meet. The Monkees were a hugely popular band from the 1960s, which were very much America's response to the Beatles. The band was created by television producers for a sitcom of the same name that would air to massive success in 1966. Coincidentally, much like Star Trek, the Monkees were also at one time animated, um, very strangely? While the band, like the Beatles, had four members, there was certainly a standout heartthrob in Davy Jones, the British vocalist and tambourine man, man, who along with his countrymen's made quite the impact on men's hairstyles. The producers of Star Trek figured that casting someone with the same appeal to young girls would only help their ratings, and jumped at Koenig. And as far as the credibility of the resemblance went, I have to admit, it is not bad. Granted, most white men of similar eras just kind of look the same to me. Gun to my head, I could not tell you which one of these were which. I don't- some of these weren't boys in the band. I don't- I don't know. A lot of Chekhov's actual characterization was really made by Walter Koenig. While the original character, Jones, was always intended to be a Russian, the severity of his nationalism was entirely Koenig's idea. We didn't sit down and talk about it. I just did it the way I wanted to do it. Nobody ever said do it any way else. What, what I did do was I recalled what I'd been told in the Neighborhood Playhouse, that, uh, that I had learned that I could be a cocky guy. I could be a, a you know, guy tongue in cheek, that I could uh, have fun, and I did not have to be a, 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 a weeping, uh, Wallflower, and that's what I invested in the character. I mean, not in a, in a great way because there was never, there was not a lot of time to really develop the character. But what I had to do, that's what I remember. Oh, Russia, just outside Leningrad, you know, and just having fun with it. By the way, the popular belief that the inclusion of a Russian crew member was a response to criticism of lack of Russian representation is actually a myth. However, Roddenberry did feel like it would be positive to have a Russian aboard the Enterprise working alongside his American colleagues. For those who maybe have not gotten to that point in a push yet, just look up the Cold War. Koenig was the kid of Russian immigrants and based his accent in part off of his father's, though Roddenberry did encourage him to, quote, ham it up a bit. His humor and sparkle was very much Koenig's own addition, however, and there was a rumor that Koenig was the one who would come up with the invented and mother Russia bit, though I can't entirely substantiate that. One aspect of our favorite whiskey, however, was very much not Walter's choice. The one problem about Koenig in the eyes of the showrunners was his bald spot. See, Walt was pushing 30 by the time he was cast and had just gotten a crew cut for a movie he did directly before the show. Now, if you're an AMAB who will have pattern baldness later in life, shaving your head around your 30s can often cause it not to grow back as thickly. 
Disclaimer, I don't actually know if this is true or if this is a wives tale. I'm a scientist, not a hairdresser. But sadly, for a fun moment, such was the case. But since he was cast for that Davy Jones appeal, they had to fix that little spot. So they gave him what can legally be defined as a wig. So the first checkoff wig is... I can't be polite. It is absolutely hateful. <laughs> this this feels like a microaggression against Russians, and if I was Davy Jones, I would have sued. I don't even need to describe why this is so hateful, it's just hateful. And Koenig fucking hated it. Probably because he had eyes. In fact, interestingly, this was a woman's wig, which is a part of the reason why it doesn't fit Koenig's, like, frankly, giant head. It also looks like it was cut with craft scissors, perhaps by a person who has never seen a picture of the members of the monkeys, but was getting a description of the monkeys given to them by a ghost from 1832. There is a popular story of a crew member passing by Walter's dressing room and overhearing him yelling, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Obviously worried, the crew member uh, went inside just to find him berating the wig. I can't find evidence to this anywhere, though I have seen the wig and therefore I do believe it. Weirdest of all, however, was that this worked. Chekhov was a huge hit with teen crowds and Koenig received buckets of fan mail from young girls infatuated with him. And indeed, um, my mail was from people who were 8 to 14 years old. You know, I think you're groovy, you know, I love your hair. And I got, I got hundreds and hundreds of letters. I got, I, I actually at one point was getting the third most mail after Bill and Leonard. Um, and it was, what a novelty, you know, what an interesting novelty. You get these these big canvas bags of mail, you know. Um, in fact, I think my demise, the character started started to lose uh, his popularity. Was three things: the hair wasn't real, and they found that out. I wasn't really Russian; and I was American, and that exotic flavor was gone. And that I was married, and that they couldn't fantasize about, uh, you know, being with Chekhov. This is very funny to me because the previous attempt to create a sex icon and cook had kind of backfired in the sense that um, the real sex icon of those early seasons was Spock? I mean, I don't get it, but I get it. By the time season 3 rolled around, Chekhov was already signed on, but the wig contract had sadly run out. Between the shooting of the second season and the break between, uh, Koenig's hair had grown out enough that it could convincingly give the same effect and he jumped at the opportunity to be rid of the hair piece. Though he still did need powder to fill in parts of his bald spot, he was willing to make that compromise to get rid of what he called the devil. Look, all in all, I know the wig is divisive, okay? Just look up Chekhov's wig on Tumblr and you're going to find buckets of people who find it distracting and ugly and talking about how much they hate it. But I, I believe in wigged Chekhov supremacy. I think there was something supremely funny about the insane logic behind it and its ridiculous silhouette, and frankly, I miss it in the later seasons. I know some of you will disagree vehemently, but frankly, you're wrong, and I'm right, and this is my show, so I get the final say. In a weird way, I do feel bad about reducing Walter to just this wig story, because he really is an interesting guy with a really interesting life, and I recommend you look into him sometime. But as far as the reason for his casting, all I have to say is... Wig, okay. Wig, did you just say wig? Yes. I know, wig, I feel that already. What is wig? wig. What is wig? No, it's not your language, it's just for us. Wig. We're Okay, so that was my first go at a video like this. Um, yeah, this was kind of an experiment, uh, entirely encouraged by like the 10 of you who said that you would be interested in something like this. Um, I wanted to start out with something kind of easy and fun, uh, but I definitely want to go more into some more fan history, maybe some more about uh, zines or uh, the Im impact of women building uh, Star Trek and basically creating fandoms all together. Um, yeah, so please subscribe or like or comment on this video if it, uh, if that idea interests you, uh, uh, or any of this. I just knocked over my microphone, I'm keeping that in. Uh, but yeah, let me know if, uh, you want more of these videos. Let me know if there are any particular stories that you're interested in. They don't necessarily have to be Star Trek, though that is the ones that I know the most about. 
um, yeah, so I really enjoyed making this, um, and I hope you stick around for more, and, uh, check out my Tumblr and my Twitter and my Ko-fi, that'll all be linked down below, yeah, <laughs> please, I guess I'll talk to you later, I should really come up with, like, a goodbye, but, I've got it, Davey, you could sing for him! Sing him a song? He's a moat monster, not an agent. They say music soothes the savage beast. But I've never sung for frogs before, just monkeys. <laughs>